Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Charlie Smith, the executive director of Vsync. I also serve in a leadership role with the Global Power System Transformation Consortium, or GPST, whose mission is to bring together key actors to catalyze a rapid clean energy transition at unprecedented scale and speed. This is being done by providing a coordinated and holistic approach to the necessary knowledge, education, and support the power system operators across the five action pillars. Foundation of the GPST is a group of six system operators from around the globe who are facing higher penetration of wind and solar inverter-based resources sooner than any other operators in the world. The five pillars of the consortium are research and peer learning, technical support, workforce development, technology adoption support, and open data and tools. ESIG is the lead on Pillar 1, and more information on the GPST can be found at globalpst.org. As a lead on Pillar 1, ESIG would like to welcome you to the December monthly webinar of our joint GPST Pillar 1 ESIG webinar series. This series is in addition to the regular ESIG monthly webinar series and focuses on the GPST research agenda and associated topics being addressed in Pillar 1. Topics are presented by both the founding system operators and other advanced system operators active in Pillar 1, as well as members of industry and academia participating in the activities of the Research Agenda Group and the Re <coughs> Research Advisory Committee of Pillar 1. An additional series of webinars on the other four pillars of the GPST is also being provided on a monthly basis through NREL. For those of you who would like to learn more about GPST and how to engage, please go to globalpst.org and click on the Get Involved tab. Further information on ESIG can be found at esig.energy. Next, I'd like to go over a few logistical matters before we get started. First of all, phones will be muted for the duration of the webinar to avoid unnecessary distractions. For the Q&A, we use the Slido platform at slido.com. You need to open a browser window, go to slido.com, and enter ESIG8 as the event code. The instructions are also at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a thumbs up button next to the questions on Slido to allow you to cast a vote to help prioritize the questions submitted. We plan to save about 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A at the end and then wrap it up at the top of the hour. An email with a link will be provided once the video file has been posted. We also plan to provide short responses to unanswered questions after the webinar, so please don't be afraid to ask your questions through Slido. Okay, so today our webinar is gonna get into open source tools for system operators. This is a changing landscape, challenging us to re-examine both facts and assumptions that have been with us for many years. It's just another example of the rate at which things are changing as we move down the road of the energy transition. Today's webinar will feature Yuha Kivilawoma, who is currently a principal scientist in design and operation of energy systems at VTT Technical Research Center of Finland. He has participated in the development of a range of energy system models and tools and has interests in a broad cross section of energy systems modeling applications. Yuha is joined by Clayton Barrows, Group Manager of the Grid Operations Planning Group at NREL, who has a similar interest to Yuha in energy systems modeling applications. Yuha and Clayton are co-leads on Pillar 5 of the GPST on open source tools and data, and I'm very pleased to have them here with us today. System operators are interested and involved in the development and application of open source tools, but there are a number of questions that need to be answered first. What would motivate system operators to use open source tools? What concerns do they have? And what steps are required before open source tools can be adopted? What examples are there and what initiatives are going on that can facilitate the journey towards professional grade open source tools? These and other questions will be explored in this webinar. Okay, just a short reminder once again to use Slido at slido.com with the event code of ESIG8 to ask your questions. And without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Yuha, I will now turn it over to you. I think uh, you're still on mute, Yuha, I can't hear you. 
Still can't hear you, Johan. Some, some yeah, I think, me. I think you're coming through now. Okay. Some other one was also changing it, I think, at the same time. Okay, cool. Now it works. Uh, let's go to the slides. Thanks for the intro. Um, so I, I'm going to start with the uh, viewpoints from from system operators and and uh, and while while the talk title says system operators i think it can be un understood widely uh, anyone who is interested in using open source tools in the in the open source domain in in a professional setting um but these these viewpoints uh have uh, been risen in in pillar 5 uh webinars and and discussions and um so i, I take this as a as a starting point for the presentation and uh, I, I'll go through uh, some of the uh, things that that can be uh, included in the consideration, and then then on the second half of the presentation, Clayton will be uh, uh, going through a bit more uh, practical stuff and 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 some examples of of what's going on. Um, so some motivational. Um, uh, factors for system operators uh, uh, ha have been such that um, there is a clear need for new tools because the energy system is in such a rapid transition, and and the, and that there is a need for tools that can uh, do things that haven't been necessary before, and and also uh, there is need for for speed and and uh, efficiency when when for the users of the tools uh, and also it's important that uh, the tools can utilize the new things in software that are applicable applicable to the to the energy system field so um, next one is about the customization so that uh, whenever system operators are um, using the tools for their own, own purposes it's it's often the case that there is a need for um, making the tools fit their systems and and uh, and work with the other tools they have in their systems and and customization is needed and therefore open source has a has a benefit there where uh, it can be more easy to to customize uh, to the existing uh, systems uh, in the same way it's it's good to have a modularity interoper interoperability and uh, and a way to get new releases that can address issues that arise in the in the use of the tools uh, in a in a relatively uh, a rapid uh, development cycles. Um, also, going open source can uh, give a chance to share efforts between the different users of the tools, uh, so that not everybody needs to dupli duplicate uh, the work of uh, of making making these tools and making sure these tools are are usable for the purpose um, and of course open source uh, gives transparency uh, by its its nature um, and then uh, then there is the uh, benefit of having these open source communities that can have a, a diverse set of skills and uh, viewpoints uh, when there is uh, people coming from the different sides of the uh, of the field, uh, from from academia, from from the user side, uh, and so forth, and this kind of a, allows to have a platform for collaboration where where people can create together and uh, and and learn together uh, about the tools and how they can be improved. Um, of course, at the same time, there will be uh, demands. Um, uh, so, open source. When you start u utilizing open source in a in a professional setting, uh, there is some competence needed, and also the culture uh, needs to be in place where uh, the adoption of open source uh, becomes more uh, uh, viable and natural for the for the way of working in the in the companies um, the system operators also gave a gave some 
points on, on what are the requirements that the open source can be uh, a, a tool in use in their uh, setting. And uh, I will be going through some of these in the, in the following slides and, and maybe also some additional ones. So I'm, I'm going to start with this list of uh, steps that I think are valuable in um, making open source tools more uh, easily adopted by professionals. Um, I have some pictures here as well, because uh, it could be that uh, I, I, I have a, I might become a bit boring and, and therefore you will have at least something to look at while I'm, uh, I'm uh, trying to make my points. Um, so th there is this uh, trust, validation, support, usability, documentation, interoperability, and computational efficiency here. And, and of course, all of these, these things are important, but, but it's of course also the case that it depends on the level of maturity of the tool in question. So when you're in early phases of development, um, many of these things are not yet so important but may, may still be something to think about so that uh, they become feasible in the future when the maturity level gets higher and closer to actual real life use. Um, the first step is trust in the process, uh, how, how the open source development actually happens. Um, uh, there's of course uh, a need to be uh, reviewing the code uh, and and um, and in the for open source, this is of course a, a point of strength because uh, it is all visible and the actual model can be scrutinized and not just uh, documentation of it. And um, um, but in order to make it actually feasible, there are things that need to be overcome. The code needs to be readable, um, and it would be very good that the uh, the code uh, and the equations are in correspondence with the with the possible formulations that are available in the documentation side. Otherwise, that's not doesn't sound too trustworthy if if that's not the case. Um, also, one challenge is that there is a large stack of code uh, in modern software, not just the model and the tool or the application you're building, but there is often a, a large number of of different packages that. Uh, are used by the application and therefore can also be a point of uh, point of risk uh, for for the users. So someone needs to be there to review the whole code stack and uh, and identify if there's potential risks and how they are minimized and uh, and then also maintain this when there are new packages and package versions uh, coming into the into the application. Um, then on the model code itself, uh, there's also uh, the management of, of new code coming into the, uh, to the uh, tool or application. And uh, then it's about what kind of merge processes there are for the new code, uh, who can do that, uh, and uh, how, how do you build trust in that, uh, that that system and uh, also of course that there are tests and and that make sure that everything uh, is doing what they're supposed to do and when you bring new code that it doesn't break anything existing in the system and the, and the comprehensiveness of those tests um, then uh, going a little bit further on this same same uh, direction the Previous, previous one was from the perspective of, of a single application, uh, but uh, uh, sorry, I'm going in the wrong slide. <laughs> so the, there, there is more to the validation. There is, um, sorry, I'm, I, I'm moving from the trust in the process to the trust in the um, actual, uh, what, what that application is doing. Uh, so, uh, there is one way to validate is against reality, and this can can work very well when the systems are simple, or or maybe also if it's really about uh, physics where we can know the right answer. Uh, 
but when we go to big systems, it might not be such a good measure because reality can be quite messy and, and it's probably not going to be a perfect match between whatever the model is doing and what the reality is doing. And it can also be hard to know what is causing that difference. Uh, but still, uh, but still it's uh, an, a good, one good way to be validating uh, tools. Another one is to be looking against other models, uh, which can, of course, also give confidence. Um, but then there are still questions whether those other models are doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, and, and of course, this gets more and more difficult when the models are about larger systems. And, uh, and often we are have test systems that are quite large and, and, and then there can be many causes for, for differences between models. And, it's hard to know what is causing what. Uh, still, it is an important and, and valuable activity, and, and we are doing that in Pillar 5. Uh, more about that later uh, in the presentation by Clayton. And then um, uh, moving from that, there is the unit testing. Uh, and, and then that is very typical in, in software anyway. Um, but then there is also the layer of, of what could be called system tests where we try to see how the model features are interacting between themselves and 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 doing the right thing uh, in those interactions as well of course there can be so many different uh, kinds of interactions that might not be possible to be comprehensive about those but but of course we can try to make sure that the ones that are relevant and important are are being tested uh, that the tool are do, is doing the right thing uh, in regards to those. And now then I try to go to the, but I already started uh, explaining about the, the next step in this validation. Uh, um, because the other previous one was about doing, uh, doing validation for single tools, but, but I think we could also be doing something more together. And, uh, and we have a, a starting EU project that, uh, we'll try to develop something called, we call open certification process. It's now first gonna be for planning tools in that project. Uh, and, and we will start with the spine off that's gonna be further developed in the project. But the, but the point really is to have something where we can share the effort of making sure that the models are doing the right thing. And, uh, and, and then uh, getting ideas and feedback and and uh, testing of features that are uh, available across the whole uh, um, field of or, or the domain that that uh, model or application is is covering um, of course that's uh, easier said than done so there is many many things we need to be thinking about when when trying to do that and of course hopefully getting people excited about it. Um, if we succeed, then I think it can also give us uh, a performance comparisons and, and, and feature comparisons when, when we would have many tools capable of, of running from the, running the same, uh, same sets of, of system tests. That I would say typically would be quite small, but in order to make sure that we understand what the model should do, but sometimes, of course, we could also have bigger tests that can be testing the performance side of things. Um, then um, the next step is to have support. Uh, operational tools obviously need a, a support available at all time. Um, for planning tools, uh, the requirement is uh, probably less stringent, but still, uh, uh, it is uh, valuable to have a quick service because time is money and and uh, and things can be uh, important to get working. Um, and but how how can we get there? I, I don't think there is any any reason why open source couldn't be do, performing performing this uh, support function. Uh, it can come from the developers of the tools, but it can also come from separate companies uh, that would be making business out of it. Uh, and, and it could also be something where, uh, part of the support comes from the, from the users themselves. So there can be a peer support, uh, 
and uh, and uh, that can bring benefits uh, by by having specific expert who really know some things very well and can help others and and also can um, peer support can help new users to on, to learn the tools and and so forth and and uh, having a network of people who know how things work uh, can also help to reduce reliance on, on third parties. Um, next step, usability. Um, so there is, a, of course, many of these tools are based on, on research and, um, and often uh, usability hasn't been the first thing in mind when, when doing this, um, but things can be improved. Um, there can be external user interfaces or, or new ones can be developed. Um, what's important is that the tools and applications have a, a clear application uh, programming interface uh, where the model starts, where it ends, and, and uh, where, how you can make it interact uh, with other things. And, and also, sometimes models uh, have been around for a while and, and they have their own ways of doing and they may not be uh, easy to understand for outsiders so it is also possible to try to wrap the model uh, in a translation layer that m makes things more easy to understand for for new users uh, while still maintaining the original uh, model code and uh, uh, yeah um, i think one challenge here is that it's typically easier to get funding for development of tools uh, than, than to focus on the usability, uh, especially from the research funding side. So maybe this is some activity where GBSD could, uh, could be helpful in, in trying to find ways how to fund these kind of activities and also to be a place where, where, where to collaborate uh, on, on this. Um, then documentation. Uh, I think there are several different aspects to the documentation that that need to be tackled when when uh, going for uh, real life uh, uses. So tutorials are of course very nice when you want to learn it, but but uh, often there are many concepts that can be quite complex and not so easy to understand just through tutorials. So it can be good not just to explain how things are done, but also why things are done uh, in these more complex uh, complex features. Uh, and, and then, of course, demo systems uh, can help to show uh, clearly how, how some specific things is, is, can be done. And, and reference is needed to have a, a, a full documentation of, of everything. And, and then finally, when you're getting to more mature tools, uh, then courses can be quite helpful online or otherwise. Um, and of course, uh, that's one of the interests of, of in GPSD. Pillars two and three, um, and and to remember to maintain the documentation as the tool develops. Um, uh, in the next step, um, the interoperability between the existing systems. Uh, there's often quite a lot of legacy systems, and everything needs to keep working. So when you bring new tools, modularity will be naturally important. And, and then different ways how you uh, how you kind of utilize that modularity by having the APIs uh, and capabilities to work with uh, existing data specifications and and also often it is the case that the data specifications are not there and and then you need uh, or then it, it can be very good to have quite flexible data structures that can support uh, transformation of data between different systems. Um, and of course, again, everything needs to be maintained over time. Uh, then, um, uh, naturally, it's very nice to have computational efficiency. Um, uh, I don't have that much to say about it. Uh, just maybe that there is a additional wrinkle when it comes to modeling because uh, how do you formulate the equations and, and stuff can can be quite uh, quite an art form, and uh, and that's one activity where where a large open source community can be useful in finding 
finding good solutions. Um, finally, just ways that the different system operators and others can can participate. Uh, uh, one aspect is that uh, having this in open source, having this in open source uh, allows uh, uh, the users to become partners in building trust that this is, uh, software uh, works as expected. And, and it can also allow to share the responsibility uh, between the different users that, uh, that, uh, that things work. And uh, in practice, it can mean that uh, uh, users participate in the code review, uh, those re users especially who have a high stakes in that things work, uh, and also in the process of uh, uh, making, making the new versions and so forth. Um, and then, uh, then it can be also very nice to get feedback from the users, uh, what is important, what should be improved. Uh, and also when there's, uh, users from real life professionals, then, then this is kind of a possible snowball where, uh, uh, it becomes more trustworthy and more credible and, and all of this allows to indicate that this tool is actually useful for, for real people and, and then uh, that can help uh, uh, getting the snowball rolling. And, and with that, I will turn over to Clayton. Thank you, Hot. So I'll talk a little bit about what, what success uh, might look like or what we, we've sort of been thinking about in terms of successful for an open source project in the uh, power systems industry. And, and then I'll talk about uh, some of the examples of things that GPST Pillar 5 is trying to do to uh, enable success. Um, ultimately, success is going to be industry usage, hopefully widespread industry usage of a particular package or, or, or class of, of tools. Um, and. And so, and, and since we are dedicated towards supporting this transformation, we think that that is a beneficial outcome because of some of the benefits that that Yuha just mentioned in terms of uh, the the speed at which we can support new methods becoming available and and the transparency of solutions and things like that. Um, one of the hardest aspects of aiding the industrial adoption of tools is that that is building the community around around the 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 open source packages that are in question and so um those communities i think are the key to ensuring the validity reliability uh longevity and ultimately success of open source projects but building those communities is hard it's hard to get the momentum it's hard to get the initial funding it's hard to get uh bring the, the code to a level of quality that it can be uh, used by a large number of people and, and can be contributed to by a large number of developers and things like that. But ultimately where we've seen some of the greatest successes is where those communities are the most robust. So um, so I think that's, that's kind of how I'd like to set the stage about talking about what's, what success looks like. Um, there have been a few areas where we have seen success, and I, sh I have a few examples here that that highlight particularly uh, a few things that are either adjacent or or um, or kind of not the core of the industry tools in, in usage. There's a, a, a really strong example in the suite of tools being supported by the Linux Foundation Energy or LF Energy um, that. I don't really mention on this slide, but maybe should have. Uh, but LF Energy has has taken a suite of tools and and curated a a set of capabilities uh, around a number of different uh, workflows and topics, and and created an ecosystem or a set of ecosystems that are all open source and and uh, have many of the characteristics that we see in successful open source projects. So aside from that, 
Uh, Pillar 5 has done, we, when we got started uh, a little over 18 months ago, we started polling the member organizations in GPST to try to understand how widespread the usage of open source software was, what areas it was being used in. And um, the, the results were a little bit surprising. Uh, there was, first of all, more open source usage than we had expected, uh, but the usage was not in the core power systems modeling capabilities, which uh, I, maybe naively, that was kind of where I was expecting the usage to be centered. But instead, it was around a lot of these uh, sort of modeling adjacent capabilities. And I, I classified them, them on this slide as applications that re require highly customizable solutions. And those could be researching and emerging, research and emerging methods. But in the industry, it was really around analytics and the ability to uh, ingest the results from probably a commercial modeling tool or a commercial uh, or, or maybe the EMS system or something like that, and then and then uh, analyze them, either do statistical analysis or in some cases some machine learning, um, doing something with those results, processing them, and then presenting them with compelling figures. And a, a lot of that work was being done in Python and supports an ecosystem that, uh, that we've tried to highlight on GPST Pillar 5 with things like Panda Power being the grid modeling tool that is open source. Uh, but as well as the the interconnection with tools like pandas and Python or in the rest of the capabilities in Python. So maybe Matplotlib or some other things like that, which are pandas is a is a, uh, a, a data processing package and data manipulation package. And then Matplotlib would be a, a plotting package all in Python. And so we've seen a lot of success around applications that are. Uh, that need. Uh, highly customizable solutions. And then, so similar examples in, in research, one of those that's been very successful is powermodels.jl where they're, they're very good at supporting new formulations for optimal power flow and, and demonstrating the, the benefit of the, those new formulations on scalable or on high, on large scale problems. And so these are areas that are clearly, uh, uh, you know, benefit where where open source has provided a lot of benefit. A lot of it is because there's need for customizable solutions in these cases, and it, there's no clear, singular commercial uh, solution that that fits all the needs. Other areas that we've seen uh, a lot of success are uh, in the the solutions that enable interoperability and data transfer. Uh, the common inf information model itself is open source, and that's one example of a open source or an open data standard. Sorry, the common inf information model is not a data standard, but the model, the common information model itself is is open source and and is uh, enables data standards. And so those data standards have not made it into the open source yet, but the the model itself is, and and that's providing benefit. Um, other areas include workflow orchestration and data management. An example in this case is a tool that UHA develops called Spine Toolbox, um, and and a few others like co for co enabling co simulation and orchestration of, of multiple tasks. And Helix is a, a U.S. Department of Energy developed project that has seen quite a bit of success in industry in deployment in that case. And so I'm I'm highlighting two kind of areas where we see a lot of success in open source where you either need highly customizable solutions or you need solutions where different disparate teams of people or different disparate tools need to be able to work together and open source can provide a lot of benefit by making sure that those standards are available to all the different developers um and then and so to this end, while we've seen successes in these other areas, we we on the GPST Pillar Five we're we're working towards figuring out how we can make some of the more core and accepted uh, modeling activities or, or modeling tools uh, make make them more successful. Why why haven't they been so more successful in industry adoption? And and what can we do to address that? And so one of the the emerging barriers has been benchmarking and and that and demonstrate demonstrating validity and 
and and the the computational efficiency and showing people how to use the tools in open that are available in open source to do the common practices in power systems modeling. And so we had we organized in coordination with LF Energy two events to showcase some of the existing tools, some of the more successful existing tools, and some of the differences between them on a couple of different problems. So the first problem was a power flow benchmarking, it's just a simple AC power flow uh, problem uh, and showcasing the the differences between several open source packages on a common problem. So we agree, agreed upon a co common newton raphson uh, power flow using a openly available data sets. And we wanted to match results to numerical precision and then compare the performance and the workflow across each tool. Um, so we, we brought together uh, developers from, from several different tools. Um, Panda Power is a common, uh, one of the more common Python based uh, power flow models or, or models that enables power flow. LF Energy supports Possible, which is uh, written in Java and has some really great capabilities in, in power flow and contingency analysis. And then I have developed at NREL a, or led the development at NREL of a, a suite of tools uh, uh, kind of headlined by these two packages in Julia, powersystems.jl and powersimulations.jl, where we have several of the similar capabilities. Um, Pipesa was also involved in this, in this uh, exercise, but contributed more to the second event than the first. So I'll talk about them in a second. Uh, we used two different data sets. One is the RTS GMLC developed uh, by the IEEE to, uh, for, as a small test system to enable reliability analysis. Uh, so not extremely large, but useful for making sure that we're coming up with the exact same results across these three different tools where we did power flow. And then we used some open cases from the, the Polish grid uh, that had a much, much larger uh, systems and, and analyzed same common set of uh, uh, same co common set of problems on these much larger systems to demonstrate scalability and performance at that scale. Um, we spent a lot of time, uh, even though power flow is a fairly agreed upon uh, uh, calculation, we did spend a lot of time. Uh, hashing out the details of what we were considering and what we weren't considering within the power flow so that we could get to a, a common and numerically precise uh, uh, comparison. Then we also included a benchmark against map power, which is, uh, at least in the research community, a very um, kind of the standard open capability. Open being that the code is open, but it does require map power to use it. So. Um, so the goal here was to understand the strengths and weaknesses of different tools to validate across tools and identify opportunities and improvement. As well as to showcase those results to a community so that we could, uh, you know, build awareness of capabilities that exist in the open source and then also uh, make sure that we could coordinate to try and standardize any formulations and specifications and and it and where needed. We, we built some tool interoperability. I'll talk about that in a second. The results were, I, I don't think are that important in terms of the actual solution time. The solution times here are shown down here on the right. Um, but the the important piece is that we were uh, we were able to get all of these tools to to come up with the same result um, uh, within numerical precision on both the Pegasa and the uh, and the RTS case. And we, we found some real challenges in the standardization of, of, the, of problem specifications, which highlight some of the challenges and some of the benefits of open source tools. We had, uh, we had data errors that we helped dealt with. We had to agree upon the definition of a Slack bus versus a, a swing bus and, and things like that. And then we had to agree upon the treatment for, for various components in the system, like three winding transformers and things like that. Um, this was all very useful for all of us because we entered this this effort in thinking that this is a very standard problem and this should be a fairly quick uh, coordination. But ultimately, it did take several weeks to 
to hash through all these issues and coordinate across time zones and things like that, but uh, to hash through all these issues and and ultimately come up with results that were equivalent and and comparable. Um, this led us to a second event um, where where instead of agreeing on upon a co common problem, we looked at uh, coordinating several tools to to work on a core common workflow where each tool uh, contributed its capability to a coordinated workflow. And so this this was really a planning problem where we were looking at how using the uh, PIXO to to think about what uh, energy capacity or generation capacity might get built in a system using uh, power systems and power simulations to consider how that's how that uh, how those generators might get scheduled in some future uh, time period and then using panda power and possible to understand the reliability and the the detailed power flow and contingency response of that future operated and scheduled system. Uh, to do this, we did uh, we we use the RTS case because it was a little bit smaller and easier to transfer. Again, we used PIPSA to expand the system, and then we used these uh, the other tools, Panda Power, Possible, and Power Systems and simulations to to consider consider the validity and the performance of that expansion, the impacts of that expansion. Um, the principal outcome of this exercise was really a recognition that we just, in order to pass that data between these tools, there was a real need to do a better job of specifying uh, how data, creating data specifications and formats. Um, this has led us up to, um, to, to, uh, this has led us to to start exploring the the role of SIM and the role of SIM for in creating an open data standard for planning and operations, uh, and and or using some of the open data standards for planning and operations, and if that is the right format. And we're still in those discussions and actively trying to uh, work through that. Uh, the other cases are. That exist are these map power PSC and other model specific formats, but but they do, are incomplete uh, and they're very uh, specific to the needs of those different modeling tools. So there really is a need for something uh, something more robust. And the question is, is there something more in between? Do we go all the way to the usage of SIM, which can be quite burdensome, or is there something uh, needed in between? And 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 that's still not entirely clear. Um, in the process, we did create several interoperabilities, and these are some of the benefits of open source tools is we can create, we can now share data across these tools in a fairly robust and programmatic way, but um, but the, the process of creating these has, has led us to the conclusion that we need to do something better. Um, so. Uh, here, so these are just a couple examples of, of things we're trying to do on the, the GPST Pillar 5 in terms of um, demonstrating and, and benchmarking these tools. Um, we, we, through the course of this process, we have fielded a lot of interest in, in, uh, in a similar activity for, uh, stability modeling. Um, uh, and, and so we are starting to work on that now. We've got a couple of the main tool developers are, are talking and working on scoping that benchmarking exercise now, and we hope to have a similar event webinar um, ready for execution sometime this spring. So, um, yes, I think that is the, is, is kind of the conclusion of, of the content we have today. And I think, yeah, I'll hand it back to Ryan or Charlie. Okay. Thank you, Clayton. Yuha, if you could come back on, we'll move into the, the Q&A. One general question I have before we get into the Q&A, specifically from, uh, from the Slido, is what kind of change have you seen in interest in open source software in the broader power engineering or power systems community in the last you know, two years since you started up this activity in Pillar 5 inside of GPST? It seems like it's gotten some legs, but I'm just curious how 
what your view is of, of how it's changing and what you see uh, see building. Is that for me or for you or both? <laughs> for, for both of you, yeah. Just re reflections, you know, your observations. I don't have any numbers on it, of course, but but I, I do have a feeling that it, it is picking up and there is more and more serious interest uh, from from system operators in 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 using them and also that the tools themselves are uh, kind of a starting uh, are, some of them have been doing it for a long time but considering these steps and other issues that need to be considered before before they can be adopted so i think it's going in the right direction i don't know how fast the movement is i I'd, I'd agree with that and i would so I'd, there's two observations that i've seen so one is a is a recognition that that um historically i've seen a lot of reluctance to use open source tools and my perception of that has been because there's a worry of the validity of the calculations that are being enabled in the open source tools. And I've, I've seen a shift from away from that where there's a growing trust in uh, a widely used open source tool or a set of widely used open source tools. And, and, and I think that comes from two places. I think that's, uh, that's a, 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 a set of materials that have demonstrated um, either faults in commercial tools or equivalents to commercial tools where they're accurate. And so I think there's a shift in the uh, the placement of trust from um, just the fact that everybody else is using a tool to really focusing on the the numerical details of the of the validity of the calculation. And so that's that's one thing. And then I just think that there is a uh, there is a growing usage of open source capabilities for all things, uh, not just power system specific. And that's just snowballing to start to include uh, power system capabilities as well. So Python is so popular and and so ubiquitous on amongst many industries, and it's it's definitely bleeding into the power systems industry. Okay, thank you for those observations. There's uh, a couple of questions uh, up at the top that are, um, I think, a bit thought provoking and good. We'll start with the uh, with those two. First of all, are there any system operators currently using open source tools, and if so, how widespread is that use? So I, t I touched on this a little bit in in my section. Um, there is. So RTE in France is is probably the principal example of uh, a system operator that has committed to making and and what they have done is is use of some open source tools, but they've also just committed to making all of their tools open source. And so many of the tools in Alif Energy have been contributed by uh, by RTE and 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 or contributed to. Yeah. Anyway, so they're they're the sort of the principal example. Although there are several other examples, I won't try to enumerate because I've, I'll probably leave somebody off the list. And, and but um, there are several other examples who are using, you know, core capabilities that are open source, and then there are many examples who are using these adjacent tools that are open source. So ad adjacent tools being analytics. They have analytics that are done in Python or pandas or in in open source capabilities. And so I think there is still value there, knowing that we are really talking about core power systems modeling and and workflow enabling capabilities that that may be in open source. So. You you want to add anything? Good. Uh, just everybody is using open source operating systems uh, okay. to some extent, at least. Uh, one thought that uh, question that comes to mind, Clayton, talking about RTE is I was on a, a call with the director of research of RTE when they were describing their plans going forward and open source was certainly part of their plans. And one of the tools they mentioned specifically was EMT, electromagnetic transient applications, and sounded like they were really excited about getting EMT, um, a, a larger body of developers around the world, I guess, involved in EMT development. Has that come onto your radar screen at all, or is that still 
kind of more an RTE activity? Um, I am unsure of the exact capability that is being discussed, but um, I, I am aware of a number of tools kind of in that space, dynamics tools, but but specifically looking at the shorter time scale dynamics and whether or not they go all the way to waveform dynamics and, and what is traditionally called EMT um, or or they use some other methods. There are two or three emerging tools that are really uh, enabling a new set of capabilities where there weren't capabilities in the available in the in the commercial space. And so that's a I think a really exciting capability. Um, some of those include power simulations, dynamics, Andes, um, and and um, Dynawu, I think is is one that LF Energy supports as well. So there there I'm sure there are others. Okay, thanks. Um, so the related question on, on the other side of the spectrum, I guess, there are multiple open source models out there making it difficult for a community to build around any one model. Is this an overall positive or negative? Uh, I, I would say it's positive that there is more than one uh, for every kind of application or every topic. Uh, then, of course, if everybody's doing their own, then uh, then we are not reaping the benefits of a, of a larger community. So, so I think it, there has to be some balance there. But also, there it's good that there is room for for new ideas, and and you might try them out with uh, in not not with the big existing uh, communities because they can become more slow to react. So I think there is a room for many kinds of of um, uh, uh, sizes and and uh, and roles uh, of, of these tools, uh, and uh, but but on the other hand, of course, we, we should have a, some. Um, I, I think it's it's not a good thing if there's too many uh, serious tools and we get too split between the efforts. Yeah, it's kind of a balancing act. Clayton, anything to add? I just agree with what you have said. It's it's kind of okay. double sided. So. Yeah, double edged sword. Um, so, question here from Russ Philbrick: The size of real world data sets needed for large scale models results in impractically large CIM data sets. Are other formats being considered for open source? Certainly. Um, so I know you has mobile project. He can he can talk to that. Has some intent on this, but um, uh, you know I think Sim pre presents um, kind of one one stake in the ground of what exists, and so it's a useful discussion point. Um, it's a useful comparison point, um, but it's certainly not without faults. And so we're uh, I think for myself I'm actively trying to understand what those faults are more uh, and and I think you bring up a good one um, and and try to understand better uh, what the role for new uh, formats and or specifications I would I, I I personally would like to see um, kind of format free specifications established and then and then let the format be decided by the users um, but there's uh, there's certainly an opportunity for other formats and maybe a need for other formats as well. So, uh, I, I don't know that I, I won't go into any specifics because I don't know that I have any real specific conclusions at this point. Okay. Uh, just yeah. adding, adding to that, that I think it's also important to have the capabilities to be transforming data into different ways. They are presented in different tools and, and also be kind of a bit open. Uh, I think it's a work in progress, and we'll see where we end up. But uh, but uh, at least it helps if we can uh, manage the data, even though not everybody is using the same formats. And and then then all, there's there's also the question of there is uh, many levels of application. There's various power system specific stuff, and and of course sim sim is uh, good there. But then but then there's also 
when you go to the wider energy system, you get other specifications. When you go to longer time scales, uh, there are other needs there that are not covered by by SIM, for example. And and uh, so it's a it's a work in progress. And okay. I'll just add one thing on that. So I do think that data sets and the, the issues surrounding data sets, whether it's data specification, translation, uh, storage formats, um, you know, transfer protocols, whatever the case is, I th I do think that that is the most ripe area for open source contribution. I mean, it's it's clearly a need to. I mean, the entire need is based around sharing, and having multiple people be able to contribute and the ability to share that contribution through open source licensing is probably the the most straightforward benefit of what we're talking about here. And so I think that's the most ripe area for th these sort of topics. Okay. Uh, there's a, a couple of questions here that are related. I'm gonna uh, combine them. Uh, if no system operators are currently using open source tools, I think that's kind of an assumption that we've talked about. Maybe that's not quite the case. Which of the seven steps or requirements are preventing adoption? I guess that goes to your part of the presentation, Yuha. And then a related question, what steps are necessary for the successful open source ecosystems you mentioned to emerge? Maybe I can start by saying that I don't think any one of them is particularly at fault in uh, in preventing adoption, but uh, you really need to be uh, getting all of those in place. Uh, and then also the, the thing that Clayton was talking about, uh, the community is very important, and and uh, and building the community is also part of the picture. And and it's just everything has to come into place at the same time, or at least. Over time, so that it can actually get there. Yeah, it's not clear to me which is the first step, what the order of the steps are, what's most critical in this process. Um, but I do think that the sev the steps that Yuha laid out are are critical to building a community, and and that community can help ensure the longevity and and is part of the adoption process as well. Okay. Uh, question on cybersecurity. What are the cybersecurity concerns surrounding using open source software for these analyses? Are there any steps we can take to address this? If cyber is a big, big question these days. Uh, of course, cybersecurity will is an issue for every software. Uh, but if we just think what is specific to open source, then then there is the uh, the question that who can who can inject code into the systems that go into production. And of course, this can be dealt with, um, but but it's an issue that has to be considered. And then, then of course, there's many, many issues, uh, especially when looking at the whole software stack uh, that you're, the one would be using, that, that they are all all suitable for the purpose. And uh, uh, But of course, then there is typically other large communities that are also worried about that and and uh, it's not that you're alone but 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 you need to be uh, knowing that the stuff you're using is 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 uh, sufficiently safe you have to uh, develop a, a cyber testing uh, segment of the uh, community <laughs> yeah i think that's a good i think there uh, of course it now depends what the tool is used for but if it's for operation, I think there has to be something like that. There has to be experts who understand that field, uh, so that that they can help to make sure things are okay. Okay, I'm going to address this next uh, question very briefly. It's a funding question: Is the GPST funding available? And the basic answer is no. That GPST is not a funding source, so uh, people have to get their funding from research activities or other activities that are going on. The next however, question. However, there are opportunities to uh, to build a, a a research community or 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 development community through GPST, and we are very eager to support those sort of opportunities. So, yeah, I think that's a good point. That there's a lot of research activities that are going on that GPST is helping to support and catalyze, and becoming members of that community and those research activities is one way to to garner support. 
Okay. Um, good question. Plans to support the use of these open source tools for university students learning about capacity expansion and production cost modeling. Anything special going on for universities? I think we'll have to wrap it up. Uh, when I started the process of my last open source project, one of the ways I pitched it to Department of Energy and others is that I don't want anyone, any PhD student to ever have to write the another unit commitment model from scratch. Like, so I, I, I think that is a, I mean, it has been a pr principal success of open source tools is that by having these out there and having them be, uh, you know, flexible and things that you can edit and change and adjust to do what you want to do they are very beneficial for educational and research capabilities and so that's that's clearly a benefit and to have them be at a quality that they can scale and address realistic or, or large-scale problems is uh is is a an issue that they haven't always been able to meet or a, a, a criteria they haven't always been able to meet so i think we're getting there um, and I am, if there are, if there are needs in, in curriculum or, or, or people that need these resources, I, I'm be eager to help connect. Uh, so if there's opportunities, let me know. Yuha, you want the last word? Uh, I, I'll just add to that, that's me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're, uh, we're just past the top of the hour now, so we're gonna need to wrap it up. Yuha and Clayton, thanks very much for this informative and very thorough look at what's going on with open source software. I think it will ex expand everyone's horizons. I know it helped to expand mine. As I mentioned earlier, an email will go out once the video file has been posted and we'll get the responses to the unanswered questions posted as quickly as possible. We appreciate your engagement. And if you'd like to stay engaged, I'd invite you to participate in the next ESIG webinar next Tuesday with Ryan Quint of NERC on modeling inverter-based resources. Further information on all of our webinars and events can be found on our website at esig.energy under events, and you're all invited to attend. And information on all the GPST webinars can also be found at globalpst.org. Yuha and Clayton, I wanna thank you again for this very timely webinar and thank all of you for your interest. We look forward to seeing you again in the near future and in the meantime, everyone, take care, stay safe, and thanks again for your participation. Bye now.